So thank you very much for this kind presentation. And uh, I want to thank you Vera Burman and Ricardo Villa for inviting me. It's an honor to me to be here and share with you some considerations about uh, my recent research on globalization. Or I should better say maybe globalizations at the plural form, given that uh, it's exactly the central topic I'm going to argue. I've proposed as title of this conference the expression the third global spatial revolution, and of course, this expression needs to be explained. But before introducing the topic, I'd like to advance a general consideration. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, someone formulated the famous hypothesis of the end of history, I mean Fukuyama. But what in reality occurred, in my opinion, rather than this, was a profound, general, and long-lasting spatial deconstruction. All the most important events of our age seems to have a spatial essence. The very year in which the Berlin Wall fell, right 30 years ago, CERN's researchers invented the World Wide Web, a tool fated to change social and economic spaces more deeply than any modern ideology. Then 22 new states arose from the decomposition of the Soviet bloc. An earthquake not yet concluded, just think of Iraq, Syria, Libya, and so on. But there is also a special character to events uh, such as the birth of the European Union or the sad revival of the rhetoric of the walls, of the Brexit, or again, the financial contamination spread from USA, which has shown us the upsetting interdependencies of global markets. What these different but not independent phenomena share is precisely their spatial root. It is not by chance that several fields have begun to speak about a spatial term and that concept of geopolitics long banned is back in use. But to try to express this idea in more and radical, maybe philosophical terms, I prefer to refer to the key concept of Raum Revolution, uh, spatial revolution, uh, formulated by Carl Schmitt uh, in a little studied paragraph of his Land und Meer, 1942. What I find particularly useful in this concept is its capacity to connect phenomena that are seemingly distant from one another, such as economy, geopolitics, technologies, and aesthetics. Generally speaking, a spatial revolution brings about a change in the spatial coordinates in which events occur. Obviously enough, this change involves an historical challenge consisting in reorienting ourselves, reshaping social spaces, and rethinking global forms. This effort, unavoidable, is unavoidable because its spatial revolutions brings an effect that Schmidt sums up in the word, Deutsch word, Entortung. This word can mean disorientation in existential terms or also relocation. For example, you can think of the relocation of industrial production, but also dislocation of concept, for example, as near and far, here and somewhere else. A transformation this profound, which implicates all spheres of existence, requires an extensive adaptive work. It needs new pragmatic and cognitive schemas, new physical and mental maps, new modes of thought and government. As I said before, the thesis I'd like to argue is that nowadays we are dealing with such a special entortung. But in order to approach this issue, we have to proceed by historical analogies. I've spoken about a third global spatial revolution, but to understand this idea, we need to return briefly to the previous two. And this brings me back to Kashmir theory. As many of you probably know, 
Schmidt's uh, fascinating thesis is that globalization started with the European conquest of the seas. The oceans supported the first globalization of the Earth, a process began with the discovery of America, offering the essential basis for the entire history of colonization and from the 16th century onward for the rise of a global market and a global capitalism. With this, we are not far from the analysis offered by Marx. But for Carl Schmitt, beginning at this moment, the world divides, <coughs> divides into two parts. On one hand, a terrestrial element, and on the other hand, maritime, a maritime element, each of which has very different characteristics. On terra firma applies the order of states, the Leviathan, regulated by interstate law, the Ius Publicum Europeum. States have precise borders within which each is sovereign, but they mutually recognize one another as legitima, leg, uh, legitimate powers. As a result, in cases of conflict, they can regulate war, entering into, into treaties and honorable peace. In opposition to the land, the sea is instead the, an element without rules, without limits, in which states compete between one another with no checks. The sea is the legal and spatial reverse of the land. It is a, the fluid, open, and free element in which commerce can create, over time, a world market governed by liberal principles, and we indeed still use the word navigate in respect to the internet, since, like the sea, the web is perceived as an environment without limits and still free of state control. What Schmidt names the nomos of the earth is precisely this balance between the land and the sea, with the different legal systems, spatial dimensions, political organizations, and mental representations of space. It is during the 1700s, however, that of course what Schmidt considers the key event of modern history. One nation, namely England, is able to comprehend the maritime spatial revolution more deeply than any other European one. The English island detaches from the continent and become, becomes a true island to say a floating piece of land, the center of an empire spread across five continents and proportionally far more maritime than terrestrial. The consequence of this change is the birth of a new spatial consciousness, consciousness dif a different vision of space, a new form of political and military organization, and a new phase of technological development, development the one still current, in which capitalism and technology blend together indissolubly. It is important to stress that English spatial imagination is completely different from that of the European territorial states. England thinks in terms of global paths and resting points, maritime connections and ports. It does not have border to defend, borders to defend, but rather connections of variable dimensions following a network logic that in some respects anticipates that of the internet. The only one power that succeeded in competing with the United Kingdom for the monopoly over the seas was America. But this only beginning in 1823 with the Moreau Doctrine. The doctrine of the President Moreau was a, a special invention. It divided the world into two parts and established that no European power could intervene within the American hemisphere. The world was thus divided not only between land and sea, but between the American and European hemispheres. A wonder satirical vignette Hope. 
this one. <laughs> this vignette represents the situation, ironically, of course, uh, and we can see the Uncle Sam who has placed his hat on the Panama Canal, of course, without asking anything to the South America, and wants his own gross realm, big space, before the envious European powers with their little uh, states uh, uh, in relation with the great space of United States. It's not here, maybe, by the way, that this way of thinking is, not, is so deeply rooted in American consciousness that it always returns. Even the so-called isolationism, for example, the isolationism of Trump, after all, the, it's the latest manifestation of the idea that the United States has its own world, the true West, the liberal and democratic, and the rest of the world does not concern it. Up to this point, I've talked about the special revolution that came from the sea and the birth of two opposing political forms. First, the terrestrial ones, the European states, the Leviathans, and the second, the maritime ones, the British and American empires. Now, the birth of a new spatial imaginary beyond the land and sea relation require requires the rise of a new element. This new element is the air. The air has not always been a space. It became one only when it was occupied, occupied by airplanes and wireless telecommunications, such as electromagnetic waves, radio waves, and so on. And thus, a second special revolution begins. In land and sea, Schmidt also came to sense this epochal shift. He did not, however, imagine what would follow it, namely the ascent of the American empire as a global power, and we did the birth on a new nomos of the earth. Some <clears throat> soon after Pearl Harbor, the United States, in fact, saw a great historical chance in the air. Just as England had dominated the world by, by way of the oceans, so the United States would dominate the new global phase through the dominion of the air. It is easy to draw an analogy between the two, but the air is not the sea. It has its own specific characteristics. The air is a superior element uh, to the land and the sea, indifferent to political borders and to people's history and cultures. It's a space even more free than the sea, depoliticized and unlimited and thus impossible to enclose. It is the ideal space in which to impose the laws of the free flow of capitals and informations. To reach this goal, the creation of the empire of the air, a new overall vision of the space would, however, be necessary a vision that could renounce the old Monroe Doctrine, showing the world to be a whole and the United States as the center of the whole. American geography and geopolitics obtained this result through a simple operation, turning the world around and showing it from a zenithal perspective centered on the North Pole. If one looks at the world from a point of view centered in, in, in the North Pole, one sees that there are no longer hemispheres, while the industrializations, industrialized, industrialized, industrialized world, Europe, Russia, America, find itself joined within a single ring of Earth. I will show you a, a few images about this topic. The first pertains to the perception or the image of the shrinking world caused by the reduction of distances measured in hours of flight. Uh, how the, was, the world has shrunk.
another war in, in which we can rec recognize how technology begins to change the perception of the globe, uh, and along with this, to create uh, the condition, um, the perception uh, that the, gl the globe is uh, so small that can be uh, governed uh, centrally. The globe gets more and more small as the spatial temporal compression increases. And now you can see the fantastic device created by Herbert Bayer, the, the famous uh, designer uh, of Bauhaus for the exhibition Airways to Peace in 1942 uh, to the uh, uh, MoMA Museum. People were asked to enter the globe and to perceive it, to perceive the, un the unity of the globe and to get a, a cosmopolitan mind. For this goal, Bayer, uh, this is other devices uh, devoted to, the, uh, to, to experience the modification of distances um, brought by the um, aviation and the new point of view um, to the world. And here, uh, the way in which Bayer experimented for the first time his theory about uh, the extended vision, the possibility to, uh, to, to, to extend the vision uh, in a 3D uh, way. At the same time, sorry. <laughs> At the same time, the same year, um, back Mr. Fuller uh, invented another incredible device, the Dimaxion Map, capable to get uh, plan or spherical as you want, um, just folding the, the paper. And uh, uh, in uh, this, uh, um, uh, image, uh, you can find uh, this uh, uh, geographical device um, uh, in relation with the famous um, globe of the president, which have the characteristics to have no axis. So it's a globe that can rotate it in any directions, and thus we can say that there is no more north and south, east and west. the Buckminster Fuller uh, map in the exposed uh, version. But now let me show a few maps typical of the American Air Age. This is one of them. But uh, as already known, uh, seen from the top, the world becomes a single reality, a monosphere as the geographer George Renner will declare. This is not a falsehood, but rather, I would say, a geographical sophistication. In another map, uh, you can see the emerging area of the planet and uh, uh, the others. And this is the monosphere uh, I was speaking before another vision of the uh, unity of the Earth uh, and of the new centrality of United States, United States with respect to Europe. We also can uh, uh, see that uh, the, this visual condition uh, applies to uh, the idea of uh, a government of the monosphere. And, uh, United States, not by chance, United Nations, sorry, not by chance, uh, will host uh, this representation in the symbol, the central symbol of the flag. This is the fourth experiment, witnesses the success of, the, of this new global design. This is the, the first version, 
uh, of the flag and then they turned a little bit the image in order to uh, shift the United States from the center because the, the, the effect was too much uh, explicit. But there are other interesting maps as well, other geosophistications. This one, for example, uh, taken from the extraordinary book, Look at the World, begins to represent space from the point of view of a telematic connections. As typical of the connective geography of flows, the focus is on the cities. Here, here the focus, here you can see New York and uh, uh, San Francisco in relation to other cities of the world, in particular European cities, while the states vanish. International telephone and telegraph, that is today one of the most important global industry in aerospace, transportation, energy, industrial, industrial markets, defines here itself a worldwide system of systems an expression that anticipates the first delineation of electronic space generated by another famous system on which I will return to say SAGE. Here, an image of an entrance door of IT&T representing the old vision of the world by spherical that uh, the angel may be helped uh, to unify. After the war, the war, this same system uh, would be extended to the outer space. The first satellite system is Telstar, a small ball but capable to transmitting a television channel and different telephone connections from one point to another on Earth. In this celebrating stamp, French stamp, you can see Testar connecting for the first time United States with Europe, creating a sort of a virtual continent. And in this image, uh, Testa, um, this is the World Fair 1964, uh, and we can understand uh, this monument, the most important of the fair, uh, as the uh, uh, symbol of the victory of Renner's monosphere uh, vision. And there, there is an orbit around this monument, around the planet, and this, this is the orbit of Tel Testar, uh, the pride of American nation. Testar, however, is only the first step of the American colonization of space. The second and the most important is uh, uh, Intersat, uh, a big project, uh, um, the first element uh, of the intercontinental infrastructure for the transmission of images, words, and signs over the world. But uh, to introduce uh, this uh, uh, new technology, uh, I want to propose you a very um, funny conversation between uh, the President uh, Lyndon Johnson and Mr. Pickering. Pickering was a very important person in NASA, a genius in effect, and the head of the project Intersat. So, consider that Intersat was the most ambitious communications satellite project of the time, very, very, very expensive, and the President uh, wants to be uh, sure about uh, the utility of this costly undertaking. So the president, in effect, the British dominated the seas for centuries and led the, 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 and, and led the war, didn't they? Pickering, yes, sir. The president, we have dominated the air with leadership. And I think, unquestionably, that we have been the leaders of the free world since we established their dominance, haven't we? Yes, sir, the president. And the person that leads the space is going to have an equivalent position. Isn't that true? Yes, sir. With Intersat, a kind of infosphere or a mediasphere begins to envelop the Earth, forming a new global environment. 
the, transla the translatio imperi from England to United States can thus be said to be concluded. But the history of the air is not over. The birth of internet, in fact, is historically linked to the sage military project, which has meant to protect the entire territory of the United States from an aerial attack by the Soviet Union. SAGE was a computer system of systems linked to a radar network, but its technological novelty consisted in its ability to transfer information coming from the radar systems on the coast to uh, the central computer and from this computer to another computer via modem. In effect, we can call it the first computer in the sense, uh, speci specific sense we give to uh, this expression. Afterwards, the civil project of ARPANET developed this principle, generating a completely artificial state, a virtual network superimposed over the territory, but entirely indifferent to physical distances, to the territorial continuum. It represented an extraordinary sophistication of the logic of flows that over the long term generated what I would propose to call finally the third global spatial revolution. This is an image of ARPANET 1962 connecting the two coasts of USA and uh, uh, pre present, presents the emerging global environment. If one reflects on some of the typical aspects of our aerial spatiality, the most characteristic is the concept of flow. For Deleuze and Guattari, any flow is a power of deterritorialization and as such the antagonist of the terrestrial power of the state. Flows cross through territories and connect distant spaces with one another. The territorial and classical state thus progressively loses the control of space. It certainly does not die, of course, but in many respects, it ends up being an inadequate structure of power incapable, incapable of regulating the entities that crossed its borders. I mean capital, or social capitals, to speak, to speak uh, with Bourdieu, and formation, ima image, creating uh, several scapes, to quote a Padurai. In all of this, we can sense the inadequacy of the concept of citizenship a concept linked to the land and to terrestrial sovereignty because city, the citizenship uh, is a figure of citoyen imprisoned within the national borders in the land. The bourgeois, meanwhile, the man of economics and communication has begun truly cosmopolitan. So we have the citizenship that is linked to the land uh, and uh, our identity as bourgeois that is in another dimension. But the third special revolution, like the previous ones, presents a great challenge. Indeed, more and more, it is becoming clear that the three fundamental spatial laws of the normos of the modern age are entering into an irreversible crisis. So, the first one. The first law is geographical. It was expressed by the cartographer Waldo Tobler in 1970s as follows. Everything is in relation with everything else, but the things that are nearer to one another are in closer relation than those that are distant, very simple. But in many senses, this law is no longer true. We might therefore say 
that every global phenomenon can be characterized as such to the extent that it violates it. The deformation of the social significance of distances is in reality a widely varied and deep phenomenon. It changes our entire perception of space, the hierarchy of spatial phenomena, the meaning of, the what, of what is present in temporal and spatial terms, and of what touches me and concerns me. The economy, however, is the most sensitive case in all of this. The logic of flows generated, generates economic relationships between disconnected and especially discontinuous territories. This deterritorialization poses a huge problem for governing. How can transcalar, transterritorial phenomena be governed when what concern, concerns my territory is not longer connected to the norms of continuity and proximity? It seems to me that we have not yet found a response to this question. The second law that comes into play in a critical phase is political in nature. According to Hobbes, the oldest and most fundamental law of the state is protego ergo obligo. To say, the state offers protection to citizens in exchange for their obedience to its law. This is the implicit pact that gives authority to the state, no matter what kind of government it has. Today, however, no liberal state that is part of global market can respect this pact. For example, what can states do before a financial crisis like the one that began in 2006 in America and is still not over? Today we are witnessing a panic caused by the sensation of loss of control over the events. But if the state is not capable of protecting its citizens, a frightening legitimacy problem results. What is even more serious is that there is not effective political alternative available. At least until Europe takes responsibility for the pact, substituting for the national states, we have no alternative to the old centralized terrestrial European Leviathans. This paradoxically make, make the state an indispensable resource, obsolete but indispensable. This paradox explains in part, in my opinion, what is happening in the present day. What I mean is that the widespread perception of the powerlessness of the state to govern phenomena of a global nature feeds a widespread defensive protectionist reflex is too global. From this point of view, what the various populism, populism, populism and nationalism have in common is that they are attempting to reaffirm the primacy of the land of the air, of the territory of the flows, of the local over the global. In my view, Brexit too, in its way, is an expression, expression of this desire to transform England once again into an island, into an autarchic sovereign space. The third and final law is both geographical and political. It says that whatever is bigger contains what is smaller inside of it and subordinates it to itself. For example, the global contains the sovereignties, the states, and subordinates it. The state contains uh, their, the regions and subordinates the regions to itself. The regions contain and subordinate the cities, and so on. Here, too, we could say that the third special revolution puts this rational principle into crisis. We, in fact, need to recognize that the global is not outside the states. 
the global is produced within the states, within the cities, within the territories. Like, for example, the global city regions, which Alan Scott speaks of. There are some cities, like London or New York, born of the sea, but then global capitals of the air age, that in economic and sociological terms are detaching themselves from national territory. They exist in a different social and economic space than the nation that hosts them. This is a huge problem of scale that we are say, facing, but also a whole spatial logic that is fading away. In light of Brexit, nationalism, and the values as first, many think that we are entering into a phase of deglobalization. I think instead that all these phenomena stem from the current spatial revolution, which reformulates spaces and creates new kinds of spatial assemblages, partly terrestrial, partly aerial, partly imbricated in the logic of laws. In my opinion, the adequate response to the current spatial revolution consists not in its negation, often impossible or only imaginary, but in looking for new forms of political legitimacy, forms that know how to look beyond the paradigm of territorial sovereignty, beyond the capital, state, labor triad. We must begin to develop a different spatial imaginary and thus a new post-national political pact. We must perhaps begin to think about political spatialities that are illegitimate to speak with Max Weber, hybrid, transgressive, and irreducible to the normals of the world of the eras preceding our own. This final picture shows the intelligent work of the artist Ludovic Bernard, titled Nomos of the Earth, where we can see a cracked word, logos, and symbols, logotypes of uh, uh, United Nations, League of Nations, the World Bank, in order to symbolize a state of crisis in our world uh, representation. To conclude, there are many social entities useful for uh, exemplify the emergent spatial structure and this complexity. But in my book, I've chosen one in particular, that is the drone. Drones have in fact the ontological nature, an ontological nature difficult to think with our usual categories. A drone is not a plane, not having a pilot, but neither a missile. But moreover, its ontological essence is divided, fragmented, spread out. A drone is partially on the beetle field, partially on the space, in the space, where are the satellites, partially in another continent. American drone, for, American drone pilots, for example, work from a military base in Nevada. The drone is thus a deconstructive weapon what their existence destroys is, first of all, the characteristic of that Aristotle attributes to the the theatrical representation, unity of space, unity of place, unity of time, and unity of action. Clausewitz would comment that they're, they're here and the very concept of theater of war. But I think that this example can be intended as a first manifestation of a general phenomenon, a general spatial reform that is ongoing in the spatial revolution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have 10, 15 minutes for questions um, for, to discuss this uh, very rich and inspiring talk. So,
Uh, thank you. That that was fantastic, um, and and I agree uh, so completely um, that and, and and I think the 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 way you encapsulate the the problem is is, is this phrase a new spatial imaginary imaginary. Um, I, I think the case is made beautifully. So um, what I have to say in response is, is really uh, it comes from a habit of mind, uh, my habit of mind, which is um, whenever we think of spatial aspects, we also need to think at the same time along with um, temporal aspects. So for instance, when, when, when you talked about um, the, uh, the encroachment of the British Empire everywhere, um, it, that became expressed in the phrase, the sun never sets on the British Empire, which is very threatening in the very, very simple sense that somewhere or, or everywhere except the British Empire, power sleeps for some time during, during the day. But it never stops if the sun never sets on the British Empire. So the spatialization of, of power is, has that temporal aspect. Um, so so in, in one sense, we can, we can make, a, 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 I would argue, a, 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 a parallel case along the way for a, a new temporal imaginary as we go on. Another example that occurred to me, that um, the uh, sort of dominance of the turbulent spheres, the, the sea and the, and the air, and ultimately outer space. Um, well, in order to dominate outer space, we had to rethink what, what, what time is. We, we, we had to acknowledge that space contracts when um, systems are in different relative speeds to each other. Um, and we know that um, we couldn't have a global positioning system if we didn't understand that. So there's a, te a new temporal aspect in that spatial extension. Um, with respect to the flow of capital, um, it seems to me that um, it's not only that we find new ways for capital to take up our time and employ us, even when we're not employed, but beyond that, we find um, ways to take, literally take up the time of our lifetime in terms of debt. And that the only, the only the, what, how, how does that relate to the, 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 the spatiality that we find in, in the, um, punctuating flows of global capital? Well, in actual fact, we find a need still, as, as you alluded to, a need for the state to ensure the rule of law for the citizens. But we still have the difference between the land and the sea effectively with offshore banking. Offshore, the very rich do not have to worry um, about impeding the flow of capital. So the, 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 if you like, there's a, there's a certain um, maximum speed imposed by rule of law within states that is, can be ignored. Um, so, so there's a temporal difference between the offshore banking and the, uh, 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 the banking that, that relates to citizenship and life um, ambition, life expectancy and, and, and so on. The amount of debt that you are in determines how your life will go and how, how far you can get and so on. It takes up your time. So these are some reflections perhaps on, on what I thought was a, a beautiful paper. Okay. Are there other comments or questions so that we can go back and forth with the floor? Would you like maybe to respond to yeah. some of the... Yeah, thank you very much for the comment. Uh, very interesting. I basically agree uh, with you. And I just wanted to, uh, yeah, I had not so much time to, 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 to call the history of the air. I think that 
in effect, there is a profound transformation in spatial and temporal terms as well. And we have to deal with it in some way. Uh, we, can, uh, uh, we cannot uh, negate the transformation. We can, say, we can say, okay, we can go back to the epoch of the sea. And I have that impress the impression that uh, the Brexit uh, is uh, 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 rotating around this point. Can we go back to the epoch of the sea, to the, uh, to the epoch uh, where dominated by a capitalism um, which uh, basis is the uh, national industry? Or we, can, we have to go, uh, we can to pass in, a, in another epoch, a global epoch. Without any representation, we have to work, I think, all together to, to give representation, mental representation, political representation at this time, at this partial structure that is emerging nowadays. Um, but what is impossible to me is to come back to the previous epoch. Every epoch uh, uh, arrived to the threshold of a special revolution uh, um, has the temptation to to go back, but we, 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 we can think that it's a possibility, and we, what we are witnessing now, uh, it's an incredible uh, contradiction between capitalism uh, going uh, towards a, a new time, a new space, and politics that is um, uh, rooted in the land, in the idea of citizenship, in the rights, the defense of rights. And I can comprehend it, okay, it's clear this, because this crisis of citizenship is a problem for everybody. At the same time, can we think, for example, to a speciality inspired to the drones? The drones is a reality, the drones is not a, a, an abstract concept, an experimental uh, of the mind is an ontological reality, showing us that our space uh, is completely changing. And what can politics can do one time uh, confronted with phenomena like this? This is, this is the, 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 the great question to me. And uh, yeah, uh, of course, I have not the response. <laughs> other questions maybe, other comments? Um, well, I don't remember hearing it in the lecture, I'm sure you were aware of it. Um, uh, Buckminster Fuller, when he published the map for a second time in 1954, he actually called it the Air Ocean World Map. Yeah. So he, he I think this is just, uh, in terms of nomenclature, a uh, nice addition yeah. to... Yeah, you, you are speaking uh, about uh, Buckminster Fuller map. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. incredible. He was, he, he had understood uh, everything with uh, 20 years before any other, I think. And um, on that map, on that famous map, the ocean air map, um, he have project uh, a serious play, a serious game, uh, uh, a global game, uh, where the people and the students um, uh, of the, the schools of everywhere could play uh, the, same, the same game at the same moment thanks to the satellite connection of TESTA uh, that made, the, that made uh, they are able to, to interact uh, in no time, in real time. And uh, it was a fantastic uh, vision of what we could do in terms of education to transform this vision of the planet, of the unity of the planet, in contradiction with the particular uh, interests uh, of the nations. Um, what we could do today, for example, in the schools, uh, for the students, maybe with uh, another um, um, device, but uh, uh, using the actual, the uh, nowadays technology uh, to, to react to the ecological problems, global problems, econ economic, economical problems that uh, are unify, unifying the, the planet. There are two, 
two aspects that I wonder how you relate to them from within this super interesting um, way of modeling, I, I call it. Yeah. So making or in a way spatializing or re replacing the, uh, the, the reference system of axiality and orientation through a flying point of view. But then it becomes spatial. Yeah? And, and so, so this image of the drones is very much preoccupying me too. So what, what does it mean? Because it's very powerful. No? And then, but how to address it? And it somehow stands as a, as a, as a phenomenon next to what um, American theorists like uh, Benjamin Bratton theorize as a, a platform capitalism, as a, as a kind of, a, of, an, of an immaterial sedimentation that is not proper a land, but it's not proper fluid as well, so kind of an aggregation like this. And then the, the, the third aspect, these models that the, the people who are in, in geoengineering, so because they do something like an inverse modeling of the globe when they, when they make plans or propose models of how to, how to cover literally um, the, uh, the, what is it called, some of the strata in order to, to, to keep the reflection of the sun uh, and, and direct it back before it can reach the earth in order to prevent and to intervene into the, um, the ozone and so on. So the, these are global projects on a, on, a, on a scale which somehow come from, they're, they're, they're not properly happening in, like, yeah, they're not like, like s satellites lifting from the ground and then being moved. It's more like they come from somewhere else and begin to, to contain. And it's a, it's a force which is, Perhaps precise because through through the primary interest in temporal in temporal aspects, I think there is a quality to it which we which we cannot really get because it's as if space becomes um, to a certain extent autonomous again from 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 uh, from an integral of historical time, which is I guess what you were pointing at. Huh? Yeah, if any associations to this loose. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry if I scared you <laughs> with the metaphor of the drone. Um, it's an aggressive metaphor. Yes, I can understand it, but it's real, and we have to face it anyway. And uh, what I find interesting uh, in this metaphor, I use it as a metaphor, um, is that uh, uh, it's going to destroy our natural, our not natural, but cultural representation of space. And I, I refer to the representation coming from Aristotle. Aristotle. So the unity of the, th the space is a theater where people interact each other. And this representation is, is, is now uh, in a critical phase. And drone is the symbol of this critical phase. The theater of war. Uh, I was quoting before, is a Clausewitz expression, but very important because in, in, a, in a theater, for example, in a theater, the war as theater, um, it's implicit the presence of uh, uh, enemies and uh, uh, soldiers in the same space. They are sharing a space. What happens when the, the, the enemies uh, do not share the same space? It's, the con it is, it's a crisis of a concept, not, a, a, not a, first of all, a problem uh, of human life, of course, is it? Of co but for us, philosophically thought, it's a problem of concept. It's an entire structure of the space that's in, in crisis. And the concept of war is, uh, in every time, important to understand what, it, what is going in our time. So I think that uh, it merits to be, to be thought as metaphor of what is occurring to our time. At the same time, I, I know that uh, it's not an answer to your question. <laughs> yes. Yeah, 
uh, also just, um, I think I'm just gonna be adding uh, nomenclature today <laughs> to the discussion. Um, another term that Clausewitz uh, keyed uh, is not only the theater of war, which we see the limitations very clearly uh, with the drone discussion, but he also keyed uh, the term uh, fog of war, which is what the general is not aware of, is hidden within the fog of war. So it becomes this kind of, um, if you think about, uh, if we think about electronic systems like the command and control systems of the US government and this kind of stuff, um, this has been an inc incredible centralist effort to eradicate the fog of war through technological means. Uh, we talked about uh, Telstar 1. Uh, before that, we had Corona and, and these kind of projects that were the first kind of technological instruments that were able to penetrate uh, this uh, fog of war on a very abstract level. So I think if we uh, come back to the idea of, of the fog of war, um, I think the, the, the arena or theater doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. And I want just to add that this um, spatial transformation, uh, it's... Uh, uh, very close to us, to everyday life. For example, when we go around with the telephone, looking at the telephone because we have uh, a map on the telephone uh, sent by a satellite in the space, no? we are interrupting the relations uh, with the space around us and we are contaminating different spaces in one. So it's a very, very common, very uh, uh, easy way to understand what I mean with uh, this uh, spatial transformation. And another, another thing uh, I wanted to add uh, as a response uh, to, the, to your questions is m maybe this, that uh, globalization is plural. What does it mean? It means that uh, globalization is uh, not uh, uh, um, a single phenomenon, but is a process. And now it has a history. We are dealing with many different globalizations stratified one on another one. So we have the globalization of the seas that is different uh, in many ways from the um, globalization of the air and now maybe a third phase of the globalization linked to the air but uh, some also of the, of the sea that is overlapping the other two and uh, creating places and experiences that uh, are blending uh, the uh, diverse dimension of the recent history of globalization. So it, it makes it so complicated to, 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 to describe this kind of spaces and the experiences we are going to face, in my opinion. We can speak about maybe assemblages, assemblages of different space, also under a low uh, legal point of view. Uh, because there are in, uh, in economics and politics um, spaces that, that are uh, partially um, in the nation, partially global, partially um, spread uh, in, in uh, international regions and cities. And we have to deal with this complicated um, environment, environment, an environment that is, that is changing. As it's, as it's changing our relationship with the space and our, our representation of the space. Maybe also this topic could be studied under the uh, artistic point of view. Maybe also the artists have changed the way to, to, to relate themselves with the space. If the hypothesis of Kashmir is right, it should happen. I think this is a great note to conclude as we have to move on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.